Welcome back to the Game Collection. Today's episode is brought to you specially by supporters of the show over on Patreon.com, as well as my subscribers over on Twitch. They got together in the Discord server and put together a list of games they wanted to see me review. Next, I had them vote on which game I would play next. No game was off the table. And the competition was fierce with games like the Golden Sun series, games from the Tales series, and even Panzer Dragoon Saga on that list. And steadily but surely, one game steadily rose through the ranks. And after spending dozens of hours playing through the game, I can finally see why. I am Super Derek, and this is Star Ocean The Second Story. Star Ocean The Second Story was the first Star Ocean game to come to the United States and was in fact the way a great many people first experienced this epic series. However, as the name would imply, this is actually the second entry in the series. Second Story is a follow-up to the Super Famicom release of Star Ocean, which wasn't officially localized and published in the West until its PSP re-release, Star Ocean First Departure. But that's a story for another day. The series has an interesting pedigree, with many of its creators having worked on Tales of Fantasia prior. When several team members split from Wolf Team, they formed their own development studio, Tri-Ace, and have been making Star Ocean and Valkyrie Profile games ever since. Because of this, you can see the influences in the game as it plays out as a mixture of action RPG and menu-based battle mechanics. However, as the name might imply, this game isn't exactly your run-of-the-mill medieval fantasy. The game opens with presenting the player with a choice. You may choose which protagonist the game will follow throughout its duration. This blind choice will affect a few things down the road, such as recruitable characters, which bits of the story the player will be privy to, and the like. The choice is between Claude and Rena, two characters who, at a glance, are worlds apart. Because Rena has healing magic, I opted for her story, but it doesn't take long before the two are united. While visiting a forest near her hometown, Rena is attacked by a beast. Seemingly from nowhere, Claude intervenes, sword flashing. To Rena, he's a vision of the foretold hero destined to save the world from calamity. And as luck would have it, there just so happens to be a calamity afflicting the world in the form of the sorcery globe, which fell from the sky and is causing all sorts of problems. Claude, oblivious to this apparent destiny and not wanting to be rude and also not really having anywhere else to go, follows Rena back into town. Glossing over many of the smaller details here, Claude and Rena end up going on an adventure to investigate the sorcery globe, a task that draws the unsuspecting Claude and Rena into a conflict far more immense than anyone could have imagined. The whole concept of a foretold hero of light coming to save the world during its time of need is a story as old and tired as storytelling itself. Star Ocean the Second Story, though, turns this trope on its ear by mixing in a science fantasy bend and a small dash of Dances with Wolves. And with a name like Star Ocean and this amazing intro cinematic, I don't think it's a huge spoiler to say that this game does in fact get quite sci-fi, and when it does, the second story truly starts to shine. Along the way, you have the ability to recruit a bunch of characters to join you. There are 12 total playable characters, but only 8 slots in your party, including Claude and Rena. Recruiting some characters may prevent you from being able to recruit others, and some characters are completely missable if you aren't thorough. The game wants you to, no, demands that you explore it thoroughly if you want to see everything and it will take several playthroughs to do it. The characters you recruit, and the answers you respond to questions with, and the actions that you take throughout the game's duration will determine which combination of endings you will be presented with at the end of the game, resulting in something to the tune of a whopping 80 possible endings. That's right, I said 80. The second story is a massively ambitious game, and it shows in details like this. I guess what I'm getting at is that if somebody ever asks you if there was one RPG that you had to play for the rest of your life, what would it be? You probably wouldn't ever run out of things to learn to do in the second story. 
To further illustrate the point, the second story has an incredibly interconnected and possibly overdeveloped crafting system, and you could play the entire game and never even notice it until you start to go digging through some of the game's menus. As you play the game, you can learn new skills from merchants in the towns that you progress through. These skills aren't like battle magic or skills of that sort, though those do exist. These skills are more creative, scientific, spiritual, physical, and mechanical in nature. As you unlock these skills, you may spend skill points earned during battle to beef up the abilities unlocked by these skills. Different characters have different talents and affinities, which will result in different outcomes as you put these skills to use. Once you have a set of abilities sufficiently leveled, characters can harness those abilities to craft items, perform alchemy, write songs, poetry, or create art. And if many characters have these same skills, they can work in tandem to create more complex items, perform orchestral arrangements for buffs and item crafting, and honestly, I'm only scratching the surface of what's available to do here, and I almost certainly would never have figured any of this out without either a guide or the gentle guidance from viewers in the Twitch chat to urge me to discover the possibilities. And did I mention that there are also entire other abilities that you can develop, such as equipping a certain item that allows you to steal from NPCs? Reno was pilfering from children before Therion was cool by nearly two decades. And again, this isn't exactly advertised to you during the game. Oh, but be sure not to steal from others while your party members are nearby, because they'll begin to dislike you. There are hidden friendship and romance stats for each and every character in your party, and those too affect the ending that you get at the end of the game. And how, pray tell, do you not have other party members with you during your wet bandits escapades? Well, when you strut up to a town, you can press square to perform private actions within town, which sends the people off in your party to do things on their own. And as you wander around town, you even get to see those party members going about their business. And what's more, you can steal from them too! In fact, that's how you get some of the best stuff in the game. This game is utter madness. This is what blows my mind. The game is massively, massively ambitious. And what normally happens to games that get too ambitious? They run out of time or money and they end up half finished, leaving players with a sense of, if only they had the extra time or if only they had the budget. Am I talking about Xenogears right now? Yes, I'm talking about Xenogears right now, and my point is that Star Ocean doesn't have any business being as finished as it actually is. It's like a bumblebee that is so massive that it doesn't have any business being able to fly around, but there it goes, buzzing along with no regard for what it should or shouldn't be able to do. And we're already this far into the review, and I haven't even mentioned the utter chaos that is the menu-based action RPG battle system with random encounters. It's flashy, it's gorgeous, and it's absolute mayhem in mostly a good way. You could do as I do and wildly mash the X button, which will result in Claude, Rena, or whoever attacking the nearest baddie with their weapon of choice, or you can methodically mash the X button to much the same effect. You can hold the square button to run around the battle screen if you think it'll put you in a better position, and I believe it's triangle that brings up the battle menu where you can choose to cast the occasional spell or use an item. The only real flaw in the design of the battle system is that encounters can take a while to get through, and navigating menus to cast spells only multiplies the duration of these encounters. The developers must have known about this, which is why for melee fighters they allow the player to map killer moves, basically combat skills that use MP, to the shoulder buttons. I think that if they had provided similar mapping options for spells for spellcasters, it may have been more viable to play primarily as a mage. At least that was my main takeaway. The computer casts spells faster, so you may as well let the computer do its thing, because while you control Claude or another character, the CPU will handle your other three party members with AI. And to their credit, they do pretty well. The only times I found myself really digging in through the menu system during battle were during the times I was trying to revive multiple party members by juggling item and magic cooldown timers, and I haven't even talked about those yet. The maybe one other drawback to the battle system is that sometimes spells feel like they take forever to cast, both when your party is casting them and when enemies are chain casting them against you. But if any spell your party is casting gets on your nerves, you at least have the option of turning the spell off so the AI can't spam it anymore. A solid touch. And while I'm talking about battles and leveling systems, it should also be noted that the maximum level cap in this game is around level 250 or so. Why on earth would it go up that high? Well, I just ended up defeating the final boss around level uh, 130 or so, and there's a set of optional events that you can do that vastly increase the difficulty of this boss, making the grind necessary. 
and optional dungeons to explore at the endgame that makes the grind possible. Let it not be said that Star Ocean's second story did anything in half measures. The game is really quite a behemoth in all things. I would normally talk about world design here for a few moments, but suffice it to say the game actually has two complete world maps to explore. I suppose if I had to point out one flaw here, I would probably say that the science fiction world resembles the fantasy setting a little bit too closely and that maybe having the sci-fi world feel more futuristic might have helped add some contrast between the worlds, but honestly that's just a nitpick because both worlds are beautiful. And in fact the entire game is beautiful from start to finish. The game has polygonal world maps to explore outside of town, but within town the game is comprised of 2D hand-drawn backgrounds, a 2D sprite overlays. The PlayStation's hardware is still put to fantastic use as the camera tilts and pans, and characters scale as characters get nearer and further from the camera, giving a pretty unique aesthetic that I hadn't really encountered anywhere else. Kind of like Final Fantasy's painterly backgrounds with the sprites from Grandia. And the music of this game is another point where this game just absolutely shines. It has big and booming orchestral pieces befitting the grandeur of the immensity of space, relaxing rolling piano that can instantly put you at ease, the battle themes are fast paced blood pumping insanity, and in the end, there wasn't a bad song that I encountered the entire way through. The soundtrack is grand in every sense of the word. And while we're on the subject of audio, it also should be noted that this game features voice acting, and if you also have a soft spot for characters yelling out the names of their various attacks, this game is exactly what you've been looking for. They seem tough. Look strong! Air slash! Air slash! Wind stash! Huh. Huh. If you're a fan of cheese, this game is a real monster. But if you're lactose intolerant or simply can't appreciate voice acting of this age and funk, you may still be in luck. Star Ocean The Second Story was remastered for the PlayStation Portable in 2009 and re-released as Star Ocean Second Evolution and received several quality of life improvements, a refined battle system, an extra playable character, around a hundred total possible endings, and even a new cast of voice actors recording whole new swathes of dialogue. Star Ocean The Second Story may have been my first foray into the Star Ocean series, but it certainly won't be my last. The game is too ambitious for its time by far, yet somehow it manages to excel at everything that it tried, with only a few rough edges here or there that only serve to give the game character. And I owe a debt of gratitude to my supporters for many reasons, and now directing me to this game is among them. <sighs> Star Ocean The Second Story is far better than it has any business being, and for that reason, it's easily earned itself a spot in the game collection.